Hello, can you hear me without my phone? Yes. You see? Yes? Okay, cool. So, microphone only for recording purposes. Nice. I'm Jonas Lund. I'm going to sit down like so we're on the same level. Nice. Cool. Welcome. Welcome to Neme. Uh, thanks so much for coming and thanks so much to Neme for inviting me and Elisa. We're going to do, there's two talks. One is called the Modern Solutions Requiring Modern Problems. And the other is going to be about a specific work that we work together on called Operationers Voice. And we try to reverse or cancel Brexit in the UK. Which somehow still is kind of in process, I think. So it's like because there's still not been a Brexit, so I think we'll be doing pretty well. I'm going to put this one here. But so this talk, The Modern Solutions Require Modern Problems, is the talk, it's going to be about my work, more or less, I would say. Yeah? Okay, cool. Everybody with me. So I start with this one. It's like uh, one of my favorite sculptures ever made. For people who don't understand what it is, I will explain. It's an automatic step counter. So it's like on your phones, it measures how many steps you take every day. So someone made a machine to automatically increase the amount of steps every day. So I mean, that's a perfect subversion of something. And it's super funny, and it's kind of like such a nice work of art. At the same time, it's super depressing because it's to trick health insurance companies that you're walking a lot, so you have to pay less per month because you walk like 30,000 steps a day. Which is like Chinese innovation, so maybe a problem or a solution, I'm not sure. Somewhere in the middle. So, most of the time when I talk about my work, I start with this slide, as many of my peers would do, which is to suggest that most of my works are about networks, different types of networks, different types of uh, power structure, like the pyramid, this the sort of depth pyramid power structure disaster where the very top control the fate of most of the people at the bottom. It's like a pyramid. So, and I've made a lot of work about this guy. This is the art world, because the art world as itself is like super hierarchical, top-down control. The like top 100 most influential people in the art world determine most of what most of us see in institutions and museums and galleries. It feels like it's a total rigged system. M largely in part for this reason, which is the Institutional Theory of Art by George Dickey and Arthur Danto, which is that art is whatever the art world says is art. So that's like the somehow the dominant definition of what art is. That also means that like quality art is also determined by the art. What's good and bad. It's like entirely potentially subjective, but then it doesn't always feel like it. So and it's like this, it's like the office politics. Like you have a little guy on top who has middle managers, who has the managers on him, and the managers on him, and at the very bottom you have like the, the workers who have no rights and no agency. So like you see the pyramid. So I've approached this, my background is in programming. I did a, like a bachelor in photography, but then I programmed a lot by the side. So I approached this from a programmer's point of view. Like how can you approach the art world how can you control the top? How can you like approach and control the top for my own somehow position? So it's like how to reach the top to manipulate my own position within this scenario. So I solved it like this. Mm, it's like, yeah. Um, maybe we can provide subtitles in the week. Next week. I'm sorry. Okay? Okay. Just taking off my shirt. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I approach this from this point of view, from the programmer's point of view, of trying to navigate this artistic network, let's say, this art world, of collecting or creating a database of the whole art world. Like a database, for people who aren't familiar with databases, it's like an Excel sheet. Like rows and rows and rows and rows and rows. 
So it's like artists, institutions, galleries, curators, auction results, exhibitions, and uh, critics, like art critics. Art critics these days aren't that important anymore, like what they used to be, but regardless, they somehow are an important thing. There's a couple of websites online that collect all this information that you can download it from, which is like artfacts.net, which is one of the only artist ranking websites, which I love artfacts.net, it's like amazing. So you look up any artist and you get like a number on what their ranking is. And number one is Andy Warhol, number two is Pablo Picasso, and so it goes. Up until 400,000 artists. So you get a pretty good comprehensive overview of who's the big artistic players in the art. And artnet.net is one of the massive uh, websites for art news and also auction results. Mutualart.com is an uh, Israeli-American startup which was connected to artifacts before, but also connected to the Artist Pension Trust Fund, which is another sort of artist investment scheme. Artsy.net is like the New York startup for art world, where they try and be the middleman, facilitating between gallery and collector. Eflux.com is like the ultimate art news, art newsletter. They have subscribers of 100,000, 100, 150,000 subscribers. They send out newsletters, four listings per week. To get part of that listing, it's about $1,500. So it's like the art, uh, the power structure is pretty high up. If you're part of an exhibition that gets an eFlex announcement, that's like a good thing. Because then everybody knows that you're part of this exhibition. So you can download all of this through writing a couple of scrapers. Where you, it's basically you write a program that automatically browses all these websites and copy pastes this information into a database. You get the big data database. Big data database is a, a database that has big data. Does anyone know what big data is? It's like data that's big. <laughs> <laughs> no one really knows, you know, it's just this kind of uh, keyword, whatever. It's like supposedly it's data sets so large that no one person can consume it. So you need to write algorithms for how to process the it's a bit questionable. Just, this is like research from 2013. Big data was very hyped at that time. Nowadays, people don't really talk about it as much. So based on this database I have, I can write an algorithm, something, and then produce art. So the first one is this work, which is called the top 100 highest ranked curators in the world. So it's like a who's who of the art world, who to look out for at the opening, who to like uh, network with, and also somehow it's a, uh, it's not a pyramid, but it should be, it's a square. So it's like, a base, it's based on a curatorial ranking algorithm that I wrote that analyzed all the data in the, the database. And then you get like a point. You know? So number one is uh, Francesco Bonami, Italian curator, curated the Venice Biennial, curated this Biennial, curated the second Biennial, curated it's like all Biennials. Number two is Jan Mut, who now passed away. He was at, uh, he was at, in Gen, in Belgium, also curated a lot. Number three is Eventor, who curated also Venice Biano before. Venice Biano was very important, we, which will become clear. Uh, who now, he passed away last year, but next year there will be a new exhibition by him that's based on his somehow last notes in his notes. This is like how influential. And number four is the ultimate arts, art world superstar, Hans Hilder Silvers, or Huo for short. He was not only number four, I think if this was done today, he probably would have been number one. He's the like, curator at large at Serpentine in London, and then around. He's like everywhere, all at the same time. Uh, so that was the first artwork. It's a bit, you can also glean some of the sort of mistakes, but this number like, 37 is John Baldessari, he's not a curator, so that somehow reveals that the script is not perfect. But it's more objective, let's say, because it's based on the data rather than uh, subjective editorial decisions. So it's based on uh, facts, based on <coughs> exhibition records. Who they work with and where they did the exhibition determines the film. So that was the first artwork from the database research. Second artwork is like explained through this complicated graph that doesn't really matter too much. But it's from an exhibition called The Fear of Missing Out from 2013. 
where I took this, all this knowledge in the art world database and wrote an algorithm for how to make artworks. So not even about the artworks themselves, but like how to find a formula for how to produce works that are somehow successful. So uh, what should success be? Like how do you measure success? What's a successful work of art? How do you position it within the art world? All of these, solu all of these problems or solutions could be solved to the problem or solution of the algorithm. The algorithm, the black box magic, where you determine a set of rules, with a bunch of inputs and then outputs, and you get instructions. This like little line right there says artwork rank algorithm is somehow uh, the explanation to the algorithm. It's you know obfuscation. Most people, if we talk about algorithms in general, let's say Facebook has an algorithm called the edge rank algorithm. Nobody really knows how it works. Not even Facebook understands necessarily how this algorithm reaches its conclusions. But it's still uh, communicated as if it's like unbiased, somehow solution. Same with page ranking, like what determines what's number one in Google. It's like they're somehow the most secret sauce of like how they determine ranking results. Nobody still really understands how that function. So it's like the ultimate somehow obfuscation strategy. But in this case, this algorithms produced for me the uh, instructions including the title, material, dimensions, color spectrum, and location in the exhibition space. So I'm going to show a couple of these works just to see what the algorithm instructed me to do for solving the problematics of abstraction. This is a crashed motorcycle. And this is called Storage Product Process. It's a single channel generative video installation. Four poster changers with line drawings on poster paper. Ping pong table behind non-reflective glass. Black Sunday satire. Door the King facial mask product on canvas stool. Uh, this is the Steve Ballmer of fridge and six crates of beer. Uh, this is Chiel Whitechapel isn't scoop acrylic and silver ink on custom rope. And this is the cheerfully hats sander selfish. Coconut soap, seven minute, 50 second video loop. So this is the example that comes back of how the algorithm plays tricks on the artist in this case. Because the instructions says that you have to place a video loop inside of coconut soap. <laughs> so how do you do that? So then you're confronted with this compl complicated instruction. Hmm. So apparently the solution is to take a 15 inch monitor, cover it with epoxy resin, then you can put, put water on top of the monitor and then dissolve the body shop coconut salt inside the water. Then you have a video loop in coconut salt. <laughs> this is Description Albert. This is also the first painting I ever made, which is painted ink on canvas black steel frame and parachute faces, diptych airways, two chairs, digital C print. The print says that NSA hasn't been here yet. Watch closely for the removal of this sign which is inspired by a, a Chicago public library where they were not allowed to disclose to the public if the FBI had audited their records to been there to check what books you had, you had borrowed. But they were allowed to not, not disclose. So they could put up a sign saying, the FBI hasn't been here yet. Watch closely for the removal of the sign. So if they would take down the sign and you're observant, you could observe, you could know that the FBI had been there. So it's kind of like a double, double bluff, let's say. This is horizon birth, grayish blue, concrete plexiglass plaster. It's like one by one meters, it weighs like 250 kilos. It's just a block of concrete. Like, there was that poor intern who had to produce this. He was struggling for a week. <laughs> Very sad. Uh, untitled, petrified wood, light emitting diodes. So it's like the problematics or the solutions, however you want to twist it, is like the question that somehow underlies all of this is, one, the aspect of the algorithm as the black box magic, this is where the magic happens. Second is, is there a way to quantify quality based on big data within the art world? Can I write, define, formulate, describe a formula for how to produce successful works of art? And in this case, it's somehow the assumption is that a successful work of art is of 
low complexity but high monetary value. So something not like a Damien Hirst shark because it's very expensive to produce, or just like for the for the whatever the skull piece was called, can't remember the diamond skull piece by Damien Hirst, but more like an incline monochrome. This is just like a monochrome blue, so it's very expensive but very cheap to produce. Something. Like it's like trying to solve this equation, you know, when the arrows go back from the art back into the network to create the nice cybernetic feedback loop of uh, somehow production. And, um, it's like uh, this guy. This is the Wow, this is the This is the it's like an iPhone magnifier. How cool is that? You can make your uh, viewing screen twice the size. It's available for purchase for like 10 euros in um, Alibaba.com. Amazing. Okay, so moving on to slightly different work. It's a part of a trilogy of which I'm going to show two works, which is from 2004, when I finally became part of an art market, you know, so like that's everybody's young artist dream to become part of an art market. Uh, and then you think when you become part of the art market, it's like now everything is easy, and then it just gets much more complicated. So, <laughs> because in 2000, this is also five years ago. So in 2014, I was invited to do an exhibition in Los Angeles with a gallery there. Who it was at the peak of what was described as flip collecting, like flipping, selling artworks quickly at a profit. I will explain exactly what it means. Okay, so art flipping is like uh, similar, you can observe similar things on like stock markets, but within art, it usually happens like this. Say you are an art collector, but you don't have tons of money, you only have a little bit of money. And you want to control and manipulate markets, and you want to make money. Like you want to double, triple, quadruple, tenfold time return on your investments. But then you go to the art schools, and you suss out like a promising artist, and you give him uh, a small budget to produce like 30 or 40 paintings. And then you buy all these paintings for something like a couple of hundred dollars each. So for him, in his position, for him or her, it's a lot of money, but for the semi-rich collector, it's not a lot of money at all. And then through manipulation and high mechanism sentiment, he, the collector and his collector buddies, now start to resell this work in auction. So they take the work and then they sell it one time in a spring auction at Sotheby's, and then all of the collectors come together and bid, and bid, and bid, and bid, and bid, to make it seem as if this work is super desirable. And then, when they have bid it, and then so let's say he bought the painting for $500, and then it sells at auction for $10,000, then that's already like a massive increase in profit. And then all the other collectors who aren't in on the game will be like, wait a minute, this art is really nice, I also want it. And then it just keeps going and going and going and going. So during 2013, 14, 15, there's about like 20, 30 artists whose work comes back in auction over and over and over and over. And for every time it comes back, it gets more and more and more and more expensive. And the poster boy for this, there's two poster boys. One is Oscar Murillo, who's the only one who came out of this, like, on top. Which is a Colombian artist educated in London, who worked with the other poster boy, the patron art Satan called Stefan Simkovic, who bought 30 paintings from Oscar Murillo for about $300 each, and then sold an auction for $450,000 which Leonardo DiCaprio famously bought for like half a million or something. So, and that's within two years. So you go from $500 to $400,000 in two years. Which is like, that's like Bitcoin crazy in the return on investment. So that's like super predatory market, strong arm market, manipulating, controlling auction art market. And that, in that time, 2014, Los Angeles was somehow the heart of it. And it supposes that all the work that gets produced for this auction is what was described by Walter Robinson as zombie formalism. So zombie formalism, artworks that look kind of the same. You know? 
and serialized. So you make like 200 paintings that all kind of look the same. Because then there's a lot of movement, there's a lot of uh, products to move around. One of the guys there was Lucian Smith, it's like a young boy from New York who made fire extinguisher painting. He poured a painting into a fire extinguisher and then just like on the canvas, finished. He made like 300, 300. And they were selling for something like 20, 30,000 euro. It's mental. So, so that was the context. So I get invited to do an exhibition in Los Angeles with one of the galleries who were somehow active within this flip collector scene. So I decided to make paintings too. And this was the first painting show I ever did. And I made 40 paintings, all look kind of the same. This like, you know, one of, and I don't even show them in the exhibition, they're like in the storage rack, because who cares? Because it doesn't necessarily matter. So it's like 40 paintings. They're all actual collages of other people's paintings, like Photoshop's. So download, because I have the Art World database, right? So I know what the works are that perform the best. For the difference in uh, how many, like estimates and how many price. Estimates like, okay, we say this painting will sell for 5,000 euros at the auction, but it sells for 50,000. So it's a ten, ten, tenfold increase in estimates from how many price. So I can find all these paintings and then put them together in Photoshop and then remove parts and make collages. So then you end up with something like this. And then, in order to make sense of all of this from a sort of European critical point of view, I also outfit the paintings with GPS trackers. So I'll put like a SIM card powered GPS trackers on the back of the stretcher bar. So I can track them as they move around in the dark. Somehow it's a, described as a Trojan orb. So like you put it, you put it in the gallery and then you move it into the collector's home, but actually I know where the collector lives. It's great. There's also terms of service stamped on the back, which determines, okay, so you can't tamper with the GPS device, but then the work will become uh, void, like no longer valid. And the locations are also shared onto a website, so everybody can see where they are. And then you also get detailed location history, which is like, so it starts the gallery, goes to LA, LA, Mexico, Bogota, and ends up in El Segundo, which is somewhere in California, I think. Yeah, based on, it's like LA. So it's a way to so somehow, you know, it's like about, if we base assumption is that it's about power and a power dynamic in a hierarchy. It's about playing the cards in such a way that I can increase the agency in my work and for myself in contrast to the whole other network. So in this way, it's like I inform myself, put the Trojan horse inside the network, but I can also see how they move around. It's like uh, this, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this. It might need some explanation. It's Chinese WeChat. You pay when your camera hits the QR code. That's like modern day arm wrestling. When you lose, you actually lose money. So here's some images from different paintings. It's also, I'm not sure how familiar we are with uh, the concept of net art. Let's say art that exists within networks, like net art performers. I really think of these paintings, although they're like traditional paintings, as network devices, something like Internet of Things, because they create their own weird, weird network. And their battery in this device, it lasts for about three years, which is the typical cycle for a flip collector. Most of these artists back in 2014 that were busy and active with this, they are nowhere near an art market at this point. It's really because it's quick throw away. Because for the collectors, there's always new artists to do the same game with. And then for me, the end goal is, of course, to get these paintings to end up in auction, which then happens like one year later. Because in order for this to work, in order for the gallery to function, the gallery sells to all the most questionable flip collectors he knows to inject it into this flip collector market. I think this screenshot of this painting, one of the paintings at uh, Christie's, this is another one from Sotheby's. And I think there's another one, they're coming back. 
I'm going to skip Mark Zuckerberg because I don't want to hear him talk anymore. Uh, he just says, as long as we give everybody a voice, the world usually ends up in a good place, which is like the ultimate lie ever, but relevant. Maybe we'll watch it because it's relevant for the next part too. That when you give everyone a voice and give people power, the system usually ends up in a really good place. Yeah. <laughs> it's not true. So, uh, yeah, anyway, so that was like this work is somehow trying to manipulate or control the one aspect of the artworks distribution and mediation. And then, so like, that was like June 2014, and then in March, February 2015, which is less than a year, I was invited to do a second show at the same gallery, only the gallery had upgraded its location to a much bigger space, but also still like somewhere around Hollywood. And then I had learned a lot about the relationship between artist and gallery, artist, gallerist, and that the gallerist doesn't necessarily have my best interests in mind, and rather someone else's interest in mind, like the gallerist's interest. <laughs> Like quite obvious, but yeah. So uh, my response to that was to make an exhibition again with paintings, because when it's really about like art market, art world, galleries, like painting seems to be somewhat the dominant medium. Which I'm happy there's only one painting in this exhibition, I think, or two. So it's nice to show that there's also obviously a lot of other artworks, but in this scenario it made sense. But then so. My way to respond to this weirdo power dynamic exchange was to make paintings that have terms of sales hand painted on the front of them. That determines who gets to buy them or not. Because then I can control what the gallery is allowed to do or not. So this one says this painting may only be sold to one of the following collectors Anita Sabludovic, Simone de Pedi, Beth Rudy de Woody, or Alain Serre. Or this painting may only be purchased by a collector who agrees to purchase two more works by the artist before March 21, 2017. So it's like I can put, I can take the agency in my hand and say like, no, you cannot sell it to anyone else who doesn't allow to do this, because the artist has the ultimate power of de-authenticating artworks whenever they feel like. So you can be part of a very fancy exhibition with some of the works that are inherently yours. Their certificate of authenticity, but if you don't like it, you can just be like, no, this is no longer an artwork of mine. I do no longer recognize this as the Jonas Lund artwork. And then it's no longer valid as a Jonas Lund artwork. This is like the ultimate power. So that I used to my advantage in this scenario. The whole exhibition is called Strings Attached. So here's some more examples. This painting may only be purchased by a collector who also agrees to purchase donation. And then donation is this one. This painting may only be purchased by a collector who will donate it to one of the following museums by March 21, 2020. So it's coming up soon. Is Not yet, but it's like only three months to go. Which is a very common practice within the art world, by the way, this strategy. To say, if a collector wants to buy an installation, you say, okay, it's okay, but you have to buy a second one and donate it. Or if you want to buy a painting, you'll be like, okay, it's fine, you can buy the painting, but only after you buy these works. So first you have to buy a video work by the artist to prove that you're serious. Then you gotta wait two years, and we put your name on the waiting list, and when the work is available, we let you know. This is like the manipulation. This painting may only be purchased by a collector who has appeared in art forums seen and heard at least five times. Art forums seen and heard is like the gossip blog of the art world. So if you're like a big player in the art world, you'll be there a lot. Uh, this painting may only be sold to a Golden Globe winner. <laughs> so there's, and then there's lots of globes. Yeah. And the backgrounds of these paintings are actually wallpaper, like embroidered wallpaper. So I imagine, you know this image of someone wearing a shirt and then the wallpaper is the same shirt? I imagine that the collector would hang it on this wall and it would just blend in perfectly because it's like super expensive wallpaper that only very rich people can use. So it will make sense to somehow to blend it. Uh, this is definitely probably a problem or maybe a solution, I'm not sure. <laughs>
there. So you can imagine what would happen if we all have that. <laughs> oh my god, yeah, it's amazing. So I think that whole trilogy ended with the last show, which I'm not going to talk about much, which was the sort of instead of relying on the art market at all, relied on somehow a trades and exchange. So instead of saying, okay, there needs to be this rich patron that comes and assists and helps the artist, actually it's like an exchange between people, which was called Your Logo Here, which was like a sort of ping pong uh, playing robot arena, which will all have weird images in your heads by now. But, uh, so it's somehow the end of that exhibition. But I'm trying to keep it a bit concise because there's two more works I want to talk about, uh, which are slightly different, but more sort of this. These works is more to show a certain methodology of trying to use what the background as the programmer wants to do, which is like to hijack and take over certain systems and manipulate the power structure. I think the hacking description is wrong, but it's somehow. The ultimate cliche keyword is subversion, to subvert the structure. And I think uh, we get more of this now, but this is some other types of works. So, so okay. I need, to, I need to remember next time I do a talk, I need to include more video pieces so I can get a break. <laughs> that would be nice. Yeah. So, okay, so this is something totally different, but also something that I'm fascinated by which is an installation, there's an artwork called Talk To Me, which is a conversational chatbot. Right. That's been, the chatbot has been trained and modeled in all my previous instant messages conversation. Skype, WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, all of this. Make a database, data set of this, send that to a neural network. Neural network is like a fancy word for saying artificial intelligence that's not actually artificial intelligence, but somehow, it's a longer story, but it's somehow, the idea is the neural network is somehow a network modeled after how the neurons in our brain move and tries to emulate this used in machine learning and artificial intelligence that powers a lot of technology we use in our phones that, uh, yes, yes, I think this. Uh, so I could do that with all the messages I've typed and send that to one neural network and train it. You train this network. Train it to become and be able to talk like me. So you can talk with me without me being present. That was the idea of this artwork. So there's like an automatic smart version of the artist, which functions as a website, which is an interface like this which I don't think we have to watch this, but it's like a bit too slow, although it's possibly in the video. So you would say like you type something and then you get the response after a little while. It's pretty slow, apparently. It's very slow. Who are you? Who are you? And then, so it has like a synthesized text-to-speech version of my voice, like Siri, but then you can make your own voices like this by recording. Like I am Jonas. It sounds like me a little bit, no? no. Yes. yes. So you can make that by recording thousands of Jonas is me. So uh, you can make that by recording a lot of uh, voices. Catch me. You are smart too. See, so he's pretty clever. You know, you can have some interesting conversations with this bot. And you be like, oh my god, he's a clever bot. And then you try and somehow understand what's going on with this bot, but you can't really puzzle it together. Because it's unlike like any other try. chat bot in there. It's like super clever. He understands all sentiments of what you're saying, that they can come back with like totally interesting questions. Uh, it's deeply suspicious after a while if you've been talking to this chatbot. Yeah. So mm. cool. <laughs> he even has humor. So uh, I don't know how many are familiar with this image. 
I'm sure some of you are. And I think maybe this story is not no longer so very secret. But this is the picture of uh, uh, the first mechanical Turk, which was constructed in a meal by Wolfgang von Kempel to impress the Empress Maria Therese of Austria, which is a supposedly a uh, chess playing robot. So he plays chess. And it's like wow, everybody like crazy back in 1770. It was like the hottest thing ever. But then it came, like it was revealed that there is no intelligent robot. It's just a tiny little guy sitting inside the robot machine pulling levers playing chess. So it's like the ultimate somehow trickery. It's like this, how to start an AI startup. Hire a bunch of minimum wage humans to pretend to be AI, pretending to be human, wait for AI to be human. <laughs> or this is my, one of my favorite screenshots of all these things, which is a conversation on Facebook Messenger with uh, Domino's uh, automated pizza delivery bot. But Brian, your next automated pizza delivery is scheduled for Saturday, February 25th. To confirm, text yes, to decline, text no, text help for help. Thank you, Papa John, you handsome man. I should call you the cards fixing. We're sorry, we didn't understand. Please confirm or decline. And I made love. I imagine you tossing some dough shirt. Dude, our automated system isn't set up yet. This is a real person texting me. I make minimum wage. Please just tell me if you need something. Which is like the reality of most AI today is like that. Because of this, because it's so much cheaper to hire minimum wage humans to pretend to be AI than to actually develop and figure out how to do it. So in the same spirit, this intelligent chatbot is not an intelligent chatbot at all. It's just me typing, answering all the questions all the time. So every time someone wrote a message on the website, I just got a message to my phone through a Telegram bot, and then I answered my name. So it's like a trick. It's a lie, but it's like okay if you're an artist to lie because it's somehow, uh, yeah, it's fine. So it's like crazy because then you think, in terms of like optimization and automation, outsourcing, I outsourced all this labor to myself, which I totally underestimated the amount of work that involves to be constantly interrupted by messages from your automatic chatbot all day, every day long for three years. That's how long it took. You know, like this is another screenshot. There's like 1,200, 100 messages from the chatbot. It's, been, uh, it's very tiring. So for me, obviously, much more interesting to pretend to be a chatbot while people talking to me, pretending to be human, trying to Turing test endlessly back and forth. You really don't know what's what anymore. And then uh, three days ago, this was like the, uh, was unveiled in Axiom, no, at the museum, museum in Ljubljana in collaboration with Axioma and curated by Dominique Coanta uh, in an exhibition called Hyperemployment. So this is the complete archive of this work, the Talk to Me Club, which was 1.6 million messages, which ends up with 36 volumes, with 740 pages each. So it's like pretty endless. And then the pages look like this, it's just like a total database dump. Uh, it's hard, hard to see, this is the very early on. It's just like a message, message, message. So it's kind of interesting also to put yourself under this uh, burden of work just for somehow have a good story to tell someone, or to try and evaluate or imagine what's the materiality of all this like unseen, immaterial labor that goes on in the world, for example. That's one. This is cool. This is like a room service robot. Room service robot. It's amazing. Okay. So we're coming up on, we've been talking for 38 minutes and 50 seconds. This is the last work, and then we're gonna move to the next conversation. I uh, just wanted to show this because this is what I'm busy working with right now, and I think it's also 
some other combination of all these different, uh, all different research or inspiration to uh, art world power dynamics structures left and right. So this is that artwork called the Jonas Lund token, which the tagline says, become a shareholder with agency over future decisions concerning Jonas Lund's artistic practice. And then we can read the terms of ownership, which is, we can read the relevant parts. Uh, JLT, which is Jonas Lund token short, is a cryptocurrency based on the Ethereum ERC20 token standard with a fixed amount of 100,000 tokens created by the artist. So that's like explains a little bit. Uh, let me see. Yeah. So 10,000 tokens are distributed by artists to form the initial board of trustees. 80,000 tokens will be, be distributed in three separate phases. Uh, what's most relevant, which comes later in the terms, is that every token gives you voting rights on proposals in my artistic practice. So it's like, you know in corporations you can have preferred shares, you can have like passive shares, you can have voting shares. So these are voting shares. So from these 100,000, if you have 100, that means that you have uh, 100 votes on anything concerning my practice. Examples be, should I do a talk at Meme on the 8th of November, yes or no? Should I, should the artwork looks like this or this, yes or no? So it's somehow an interactive kind of uh, investment scheme, let's say, invest in your own This was decided on by the board. I don't think me personally would ever have settled on something like this blunt, but I think uh, with the board, I have all the justification I need to do whatever I want, more or less because it's optimized decision making. So currently you can get these tokens by a couple of different ways. You can either get them if you're a collector by purchasing wall-based work that comes with X amount of tokens, or you can buy at specific locations, you could buy X amount of tokens, this was an art Dusseldorf, uh, where you could just buy tokens straight up. Currently you can't. There's other ways, we'll get to it. I thought I'd show you one of the proposals, just to give you insight, because this is reserved for Jonas Lund token board members alone. So this is like very uh, privileged moment when we share the public proposal. So this is a proposal for the proof of work exhibition at the Schinkel Pavilion in Berlin. So. To the left is the description, and then to the right is all the different votes. So it's like, to the board, I say, Dear JLT board, I've been invited to show Jonasun Talk in a Chinko Pavilion in the first week of September. <coughs> the show is curated by Simon Denny, who, is, who in turn has invited five curators as nodes in the network. Each of these curators then invite two artists, of which I'm one of, with the curator being for, who's also a JLT board member show somehow the nepotism going on. So the curator, who's already part of the Jonasun Token Board, invites me to be part of an exhibition about cryptocurrency. Hmm. So this proposal involves is for how to best represent the abstraction of the Jonasun Token in this setting slash content. As the wall-based pieces primarily function as certificates of purchasing tokens, it is a question of where to place the abstraction in connection with the visual identity of the JLT. So for this vote, there's four different options for what the work should look like in the upcoming show, as embodied as different continuations of the token pieces from the JLT launch. So our first option is the plain CNC and engraved plywood. That would be option one. Option two, plain CNC and engraved plywood that's been painted with an assortment of acrylics, watercolors, false spray paint gels, and mediums. After some weeks, this is the finalized go. Or same shape as above, but with a more didactic and certificate approach. The birds in these versions are placeholders, as I would open up the selection of the shapes and birds to all token holders in a separate vote. Option number four, take the token piece from option two and burn it in a controlled way to create something that's very fragile. The credit is for this idea goes out to confirm to us. By the way, in a while there will be some more votes. Okay, yeah, this is just like updates, updates. And then we can go back and look at what people vote, and what people say. 
So <clears throat> Sebastian Schmig, which is a friend in Berlin, says, I like number three's texture. However, the holes in one and two are 100% the key. Furthermore, the owner should get to explain the key. In the close-up, you show number two surface look nice, but I prefer number one's more vibrant color, wood currency, paper money. 500 JLT is on option one. Hampus Limbaugh says, I like option one and two equally. But that's not an option because you gotta pick one and you vote. So he wrote both options. Christian Paul, which is the curator of digital at Whitney Museum in New York, says, I like folding the description of the token's function into the object itself. It makes the token a token, a representation of its function. Explaining its function in the form of a label or external info next to the option one or two, museum fights it. Museumifies it. That's a good word to remember. Uh, option four is nice, but it becomes a bit, bit of different kind of commentary. Uh, really, at the front, which is a curator in France, she's from France. Uh, she says option three might be a bit too friendly looking, but it's not too neutral or minimal. And Annette, which is Annette Ahmed, it's Annette Decker, she's a critic slash academic kind of art writer based in Amsterdam. She's the most critical of all the board members. She says, overall not too convinced about the token, however from aesthetic point of view the holes are a major plus. The wood a bit too simplistic, the paint trying too hard, the graphics and text too scattered, too explanatory, too much. The burning is the best, the part past is always transformed and memories beats memorabilia. Number three explains, <coughs> sorry. Huh. Hmm. Number three explains itself, well, well, but where are the holes? Simon Bartol and Simon Denny, who's the main curator of the show, which then gets more importance because it's a conversation says, as it's an exhibition that will have a broadish mainstream German art audience, a work which has a component of explanation to it will be helpful for viewers not so familiar with tokenized art systems. Yes. <coughs> Ode, which is the second curator, says, the literality of the third proposal makes me go for it. That's what money is about anyway. And art and contract. If something states itself as something, then it is. And when it displays the belief system it relies on, I can only fall for it. Let's open the birds for a vote. Uh, so we see here then the final result that option number three wins, and then that's the decision. So then that's how it functions. And then there's a, bu a bunch of comments from me, like an update. It's been an interesting conversation between the abstract versus didactic approach, and good points from both sides of the spectrum. As the wall-based piece functions as a representation of something rather abstract, I find it helpful with an explanation embedded in the piece itself. As Christian, as Christian points out, it makes the token a token a representation of its function. In a similar vein as a bond certificate or paper currency, the value is produced through its function. So this is some results of other votes of different types of manifestations of what it looks like. I think this is the like the token shape where the hole is the actual token. So it's like the hole. Here's like an elephant. And then here's some older representation of this wall based work. And you can also get Unison tokens through fulfilling the Unison token bounty program which is uh, the ultimate representation of the nepotism of you scratch my back, I scratch your back. So which is the somehow internal art world economy. So by doing certain things that uh, helps to promote the Jonas Lund token uh, attention or position, you get different amounts of tokens. So for example, to invite Jonas Lund to give a talk, you can get between one and 200 Jonas Lund tokens. This goes out to Meme can request this online. And to write a positive review, to include it to an exhibition, you get different amounts of tokens. It's like somehow to incentivize participation. And I'm currently, and this is like top secret, but nice to show regardless, I'm currently working on a new version of this website, and a new everything, and a new sign-up system when it becomes a bit more participatory. I'm gonna show you 
one of these like conversations in order to join the you know, Zoom token network community, you have to answer a bunch of questions, like a questionnaire, which will also come back in the second talk, I think. Which looks a bit like this. It's like somehow an automatic chat interface. So that's like one way of signing up to this thing. Um, there's like some type of pathways you have to navigate to find your way. And for me to also get to know the community better because this was one version of being the artist. You have a total different set of questions if you're a collector or a curator or a gallerist or a dealer or an auctioneer or non related to art world. Uh, this one will launch, like soft launch next week, so you can go check it out. I think that would be nice. I think uh, we're almost at the end of this uh, presentation. I just want to show this video and then summarize with something clever. <laughs> So uh, in China, you can you can uh, pay for the food in the canteen automatically with your face. So what we see is the food getting scanned and the computer system figuring out what the food is, and then you automatically just pay with your face. That's the future. Uh, similarly to this, which I also find quite, which they're testing in Sweden. It's just like automatic attendance at school. Good music. So you can no longer skip school because now it's a computer system that's in charge of attendance. So, in a way, this is a few of the works I've done over the years. There's, like, I think on my website, something like 180 works. So there's a lot more, but this is like gives some different types of insights into a methodology of trying to trying to, I think, subvert is still the best description. To try and like take something, a system or an established standard, and then manipulate it in such a way. You can reveal the dynamics or the power structures that are inherent in it. I think a lot of the works of the art world is specific. You can transpose to any type of hierarchical power structure. It's just that the art world is so extremely hierarchical that it's easier to approach it as a way. You can think of like political situations quite similar. Most of functions in society is kind of like this. So, which we will see in the second talk more about. But I suggest. Before we start, Dan, that we have a little break. Yeah? Fantastic. Okay. Thank you.